verse 5. Matthew 6, verse 5, and the Lord Jesus is speaking. This is in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, as we call it. Matthew 6 and 5, and he says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. We'll end our reading there. We know this is the word of the Lord. And that he will bless it to our hearts today. As you know, we are continuing our series on what is referred to as the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, or the Pater Noster, if you like to use the Latin expression for it. It is the prayer that the Lord Jesus Christ teaches us to pray. It is therefore a prayer that we pray in the knowledge that this is the will of God, for if we ask anything according to his will, the writer of Scripture tells us we know that He hears us, and if we know that we, He hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. We need not, therefore, be in any confusion as to what the matter of our prayer is. For the Lord Himself, who is our Advocate and High Priest and Intercessor, puts the very words in our mouth. And I do recommend again to you the habit and the practice of daily bringing these very words before the Lord, not merely in, in a cavalier fashion, and not, as it were, in an unthinking way, but using them, not just the words themselves, which we may do legitimately, but using them also to pattern our petitions upon. And as we have looked at the prayer, we have spent some considerable time in the opening address that we use when we come to God, our Father, in heaven or our father who art in heaven and i quite intentionally lingered with that because i think it's important the rest of the prayer you see really flows from what we understand about our father to whom we come if indeed he is our father and he is because of the gospel and because of the fact that we have been brought through the gospel, by faith into his family, by receiving the Lord Jesus, we have been given the right to be called the children of God. We have considered the fact that he is our Father, and as such he is accessible to us at all times and in all circumstances. We have thought about how approachable that he is, that he is a Father who has a gentle heart, that he has a gracious heart, that he has a generous heart towards us as his children. And more than that, he is not only accessible and approachable, but he is affectionate. He loves us. We want to marinate in that thought again this morning. We don't want again this statement that God loves us to be something that is uh, carelessly come, comes off our lips, but something that engages all of the thoughts of our mind and all of the meditations of our heart. We are loved. Child of God this morning, you are loved with an everlasting love. A love that was set upon you by a God who had full knowledge of every mistake you would make, of every failure you would have, of every sin you would commit. And knowing that, he still loved you. And he's not now going to have buyer's remorse, having set his love upon you, he's not going to change. 
He loves you still. Wherever you're at today, uh, however you've come into this service this morning, maybe feeling a great deal of guilt and shame perhaps for something that only you know, but realize that you come today into the presence of a Father who loves you still. He's affectionate towards us and he delights in us. And he delights to express that delight concerning his people. He sings over us. He rejoices in us. He delights to bless us. He delights to bestow upon us the very best that is for us. Because he's a wise father that knows what we need better than we know it ourselves. But we know this. And as Jesus said, if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give good gifts to those that ask? <coughs> if He is our Father and that's His heart, He is our Father in Heaven. And we thought about this last Lord's Day. The fact that He is in Heaven sets before us the reality of His supremacy and sovereignty. And we thought about how He is supreme in wisdom. He is supreme in resources. He is supreme in power. And putting all of that together, surely as we think about that, the truths that are there, which are biblical truths, real truths, should motivate us and encourage us to bring our petitions before Him. After all, why would you be encouraged to come if He was not a God whom we've just described. But because he is all of those things, surely it should stir our hearts to enter with joy and with expectancy and confidence into his immediate presence. And we come there, therefore, to this first petition. And it is very much linked with what we have just said. Our Father in heaven, that's the address. So we address God and then we begin to ask God. And what do we ask God is the first thing that is mentioned here, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Now, I have to confess to you that of all of the petitions that are listed here, and as we've pointed out from the beginning, <coughs> there are six of them, three with reference to God and three with reference to us. This is perhaps the most difficult in terms of how we are to understand it. What does it mean? And why does the request and the desire behind it flow from what we have seen already of God in his address, our Father in heaven? Well, I, I think that as you come to ask yourself the question in Scripture, what does anything mean, it's always good to define your terms. What do the terms mean? And there are two terms there that are vital for our understanding the first one, obviously, is this. What does it mean when he talks about his name? How will be your name? And secondly, what does it mean to hallow his name? <coughs> what do we mean when we refer to God's name? That's the first question I think that we must answer this morning. And when you turn to the Word of God, you'll discover something very interesting, that the Bible has much to say, God has much to say about his name. He tells us both how he regards his own name, and he also tells us a lot about how he desires his name to be regarded by us and by all that he has created. For example, when we think about how God regards his own name, he tells us that he is jealous for his name. He tells us, moreover, on many occasions in Scripture that when he acts, he acts for the sake of his name. You think especially of the times when he revived his ancient people, Israel, when he restored to them their blessings and his favor to them. He reminded them that he didn't do it as it were, because of anything that was worthy in them, but he says, I did it for my name's sake. So very obviously, God is a God who regards, rightly regards, his name as sacred. What about us? How are we to regard God's name? Well, 
if, we, if there was only one part of Scripture to which we could, could return or turn to in that regard, it would be the, the third commandment. What does the third commandment tell us? You're not to take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Or to put it on the positive side, the flip side of that negative, that we are not to take it in vain. How are we then to use the name of the Lord? And surely we would be reminded this morning of the many occasions in Scripture, especially in the book of the Psalms, where we're told to bless the name of the Lord. Psalm 103, for example. Bless his holy name. We read in the first verse of that psalm. So this surely should arouse within us a curiosity about this name that we're talking about this morning and about this petition that we, we bring to God. Hallowed be your name. Clearly this name is, is more than just a convenient label. Clearly this name is, has got great significance to it. You may remember some years back, a couple of years probably now ago, as we came into the Advent season running up to Christmas, the theme was What's in a name? And you know that was a quote taken from Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet, if you've ever read it. If you haven't, that's quite all right. But the question is asked, what's in a name? And that which we call a rose by other, any other name would smell as sweet. But you know, when it came to the name of God, when it came to our examination of the name of our Savior, we discovered that there's everything in the name. And indeed it is that name that has been the theme and subject of much of our hymnology. Remember the words of John Newton's great hymn, How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's in the ear. It soothes his sorrows, heals his wounds, and drives away his fear. Dear name, the rock on which I build, my shield and hiding place, my never-failing treasury filled with boundless stores of grace. What does a name mean then? Well, a name signifies the one whom it represents. God's name represents all that God is. And that's what I read to you this morning from the book of Exodus chapter 33, where Moses was told by the Lord that he would proclaim his name before him. Exodus chapter 34 and it tells us in verse 5, The Lord descended in the cloud. This is in Sinai now. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him that is Moses there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed. Now he is proclaiming now his name. The Lord, the Lord. That word Lord, if you're a using your King James Bible or the ESV, you'll discover that that word Lord is written in capital letters in your Bible. Not just the first letter, but all of the letters are written. And that's to signify something very significant. Because that word Lord is the word Yahweh in Hebrew, or so some prefer the word Jehovah. And that is a word which literally means the one who was, who is, and who is to come. It's a name that signifies God's eternity, God's supremacy, God's sovereignty, God outside of time, creating time, the ruler and the mighty potentate of all things. And you'll notice that he repeats that twice, the Lord, the Lord. So he's telling us even in the use of that name something about himself, isn't he? He's telling us about his great attributes, that he is the sovereign creator and ruler of everything. But then he goes on and he gets, he gets down to specifics. And he says, a God merciful and gracious, he's still proclaiming his name. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness and so on. And when you look at all of these things which God says make up his name, what is he basically telling us? He's saying, this is who I am. So God's name stands for all that he is. It's important for us to remember that. It is that by which he is known. 
And when I say that by which he is known, I mean that, that by which he, he, his character, his attributes are known. We use this word in, in uh, modern English. Everyday, everyday expressions, we, we use the word name in, in, in this sense. For example, we talk about people, a certain person having a name for something. Or making a name for yourself. You've heard those expressions. Or somebody has a bad name. What do we mean by that? We're talking there about their reputation. A person has a bad name, they have a bad reputation. A person has made a name for themselves, whether well, we can look at that either positively or negatively, but they have a name for something. And that, of course, indicates who they are or what they are, their reputation. And it's the same with God. God's name stands for his reputation. And how, how does a person get the name. Well, they get the name by what they say and by what they do. Isn't that right? A person does something bad and they have a habit of doing something bad, they get the name of being a kind of bad person. Something is somebody accomplishes something good, either by what they have said or by what they have done. They, we say they have made a name for themselves. How does, how does God get his reputation, as it were? We can say this, that, that God gets his reputation. He reveals to us all he is. By what he says and by what he does. All the characteristics that his name reveals are God's name. He speaks to us as he did to Moses. He said, this is what I am. I'm the sovereign Lord. I'm the ruler of all things. I am Yahweh. I have no beginning. I have no end. But more than that, I am mercy, I am grace, I am long-suffering, I am full of loving kindness. This, he says, is my name. Isn't it wonderful to know that God's name, according to himself, to Moses here in Exodus 34, is merciful? Isn't it good to know that his name is, is gracious? I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but throughout our studies of in this, we have looked again and again to the person of our Savior, the Lord Jesus, God in the flesh, the second person of the Trinity, and, and how he has proclaimed to us in his words and in his actions all that God is. And what do you see preeminently in the Lord Jesus Christ? For the book of Hebrews tells us is the brightness of the Father's glory and the express image of his person. What do you see preeminently in his life? You see mercy, you see grace, you see loving kindness, and you see forgiveness. Isn't it wonderful that we worship a God and that's who he is, that's his name. Then we ask ourselves a second question. By way of definition, not only what does it mean to hallow his name, and we thought about that, but what does it mean to hallow his name? Hallowed be your name. Well, the word be, for example, maybe is, is not the most mysterious, but it does contain in the mood in which it is written in the, in the original Greek, it contains the idea of desire. In other words, we, we might understand by the grammar here that it could be translated, let your name be hallowed, or may your name be hallowed. What does the word hallowed mean? It's not a word which is in common use today in English, but it used to be back in the, in, in the days in which the, uh, the, old, or the, the, the Bible was translated, the King James Version was translated, the word hallow was a word which would have been in common use. It comes from a Greek word which literally means holy or sacred. So what are we praying when we say, let your name be hallowed? We're saying, may your name be recognized and treated as sacred. In other words, what we're asking God and what we desire of God when we use this petition to him in prayer, what we're really desiring is that his name be honored. 
Or to put it in another way, that his name might be glorified. That's what's conveyed to us in the words of this first petition. Let your name be glorified. Let your name be regarded as, as worthy of honor. Let your name be regarded as, as sacred. And can you see immediately why this is linked to what we understand in the address, our Father who art in heaven? Because if we know God to be whom he has revealed himself to be as our Father, do we not desire that his name would be honored in this world? Do we not desire that his name might be treated as something worthy of respect? Do we not desire that in this world in which we live that his name, and because we are his children we do desire this, and because we have known his love and his grace, do we not desire that men should know and believe and speak well of him? That's evidently not the case in the wider world in which we live, isn't that right? Many of us today working out in the, in, the, in the world, moving among people who are largely unconverted, if they use the name of God at all, isn't it true that it is often used in a blasphemous sense? Isn't it true that the name of our God is often used in a sense which is blatantly contrary to the commandment of God, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain? You know, the great desire of our Lord Jesus Christ in the days of his earthly ministry was the glory of his Father's name. In John's Gospel, chapter 12, and verse 28, we find our Savior praying these words, Father, glorify your name. And the response was one of the rare responses where God spoke audibly from heaven in the ministry of the Lord Jesus and he said I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Notice it is the prayer of Jesus that the Father's name might be glorified and when we pray this prayer we're praying as it were alongside of him. We're uniting our voices with the voice of our Savior himself and we're lifting it up to our Heavenly Father and we're saying Lord glorify your name in all the earth. There's a sense in which we could say this encompasses everything else that we're going to see as requests or petitions in this particular prayer. Because when God does certain things, he brings glory to his name. So, so we've, we've thought about the motivation, that he is our father. We've thought about the meaning, what does it mean? His name, what does hallowing his name mean? So that obviously leads us to the third point this morning. How is this accomplished or how is it done? What is the manner by which God's name is glorified and honored and regarded as sacred? I think we need to stop and stand back and say this first of all. We cannot pray this in a non-hypocritical way without recognizing that and desiring that God's name might be honored, might be glorified in us and through us. Your tendency always is to look out on others and yes it is good to pray and it is right to pray as this prayer indicates to us, Lord let your name be glorified. Everywhere in this world where at present your name is sullied and dishonored and treated with contempt and spoken in blasphemy, Lord, work in such a way that men will see your glory and honor your name. But we must begin with us. Again, we find that our Lord Jesus Christ helps us to understand what this means. Because the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry not only prayed that the Father would glorify his name, he actually, in prayer to the Father, could state with complete honesty that he had glorified the Father's name. You remember his great prayer in John's Gospel, chapter 17. He said this as he addressed the Father. He says, Father, I have glorified thee upon the earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. So we're asking the question this morning, if this is the desire of our hearts, 
that God's great name and all that he is should be glorified and regarded with reverence and awe by men. And especially when we look at ourselves and we ask, how is it that I can so live that God's name might be honored and glorified in me and through me? We look at the Lord Jesus and he says, I have glorified your name. And we ask the question then, how did Jesus glorify the Father's name? Now that would require a sermon longer than most Puritans would write. Because that's a subject that I think could engage our attention for a long, long time. We, we could argue, I would argue this morning, that Jesus came into this world for this very purpose above everything else, that he might glorify the Father. And all that he did and all that he said and all that he has accomplished, even for our salvation, was ultimately that the Father might be glorified. And so there are, we could go into this in many ways. For example, we could talk about what Jesus did. All his acts, all his miracles, all of them brought glory to the name of the Father. But I could say this, and I want to zero in upon this this morning. Our Lord Jesus Christ glorified the Father, and we glorified the Father. And this is going to sound very strange. I want you to think about it this morning. He glorified the Father by trusting Him. <coughs> by trusting Him. There's a school of thought out there which says that Jesus did not have faith. I don't know how anybody can possibly come to that conclusion. Jesus trusted in His Father. That's faith. How do I know that? Well, the Messianic Psalm, Psalm 22, you remember it was written of him. It begins with the very words that he uttered from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when you go down through that psalm, and remember it is essentially Messianic, and it says this concerning the Messiah, he trusteth in God. He trusteth in God. We read in the book of Hebrews that our Lord Jesus Christ is the great example and he is the perfect example of faith. And hence he is the author and the perfecter of our faith. The fact that our Lord Jesus Christ prayed is evidence of the fact that he had faith because that's what true prayer is. It is an expression of our belief in and our trust in in God and in all that he has promised to be for us. And I would put it to you this morning that our Lord Jesus Christ in all of his life and in all of his ministry and in all that he did was characterized by this and this was to the glory of God that he trusted in his name. Think of that for a moment this morning. Before you start thinking about doing anything and activity, when we hear these words, how to glorify God, immediately think, what have I got to do? What have I got to do? When we think about activity. Well, let's draw back a little from that this morning and say, we glorify God best and most when we simply trust Him. Why? Because when you trust Him, you are acknowledging by the very act of your trust that he is trustworthy. And that glorifies him. It helps us to understand that that flip it around. What is perhaps the worst insult that you could give to someone? Is to tell them you don't believe them. Because by telling them you don't believe them, what are you doing? You're impugning their character. You're saying they are not trustworthy, that they're liars. That's why the New Testament puts it so bluntly. And he that believeth not God has made him a liar. Is that honoring his name? No, that's impugning his name. That's sullying his name. That's putting a stain upon his name. But when you trust in him and you believe in him, you are acknowledging, Lord, you are everything that you have said you are. And this is true whether I'm trusting him for his mercy or whether I'm trusting him for his grace 
Or oh, whether I'm trusting him for the pardon of my sin, or whether I'm trusting him for the provision of my needs, or whether I'm trusting him for the protection of my soul, or whether I'm trusting him for my perseverance in the faith, when I'm trusting in him, I am saying to him, Lord, you're a God who is worthy to be trusted for all of these things. Unbelief sullies the name of God. Belief and trust glorifies God. His name. <clears throat> isn't, that, is, isn't that a strange thing to say that to depend upon God, to receive from God is to actually honor God and honor His name. Dr. John Piper put it very well. And I, I, I'll read to you this quote. He's, and he says, The glory of bread is that it satisfies. The glory of living water is that it quenches thirst. We do not honor the refreshing, self-replenishing pure water of a mountain spring by bringing buckets of water up the path to make our contribution from the ponds below. We honor the spring by feeling thirsty, getting down on our knees and drinking with joy. Then we say, Ah, that's worship. And we go in the strength of the fountain, that serves. The mountain spring is glorified most when we are most satisfied with the water. And he goes on to say, tragically, most of us have been taught that duty, not delight, is the way to glorify God. We trust Him. You trust him for all needed grace. And what are you saying? You're saying, God, you are a God of grace who imparts that grace, who has promised to give that grace. I believe that's who you are. And I believe that you will do as you have said. And in giving credit to God for telling the truth, we honor him. I'm going to end it there. But when we come to pray this prayer so familiar to us, remember that when you say, Lord, let your name be hallowed. And when you ask yourself the question, Lord, how can I best hallow your name? How can I best bring glory to your name? The Lord would answer, trust me.